curious if you've ever experienced a sense of exclusion in life or in sport. How about a sense of inclusion, feeling like you're part of something bigger than yourself in life or in sport? Respecting individuals, inclusive language education. Welcome to today's session. Uh, this session was created for the BC Winter Games here in Vernon, BC. My name is Christy Ware. My pronouns are they, them. I'll be your instructor for today's education. I am the inclusion chair for this year's BC Winter Games, and I'm excited to bring you this inclusive education session. So in the spirit of reconciliation, I acknowledge that I am living and teaching today on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan First Nations. Um, knowing this is a small but important first step in the reconciliation process between First Peoples of the land and individuals and institutions that now call this land home. Um, if you would like to learn more about the territory that you reside on, I encourage you to jump over to nativeland.ca. It's an interactive website. You can put in the territory or community that you reside on, uh, and you can it will populate um, information about the treaties that exist, culture, language, those kinds of things. It's a very interactive experience, and it can help you uh, on your learning journey. So I always encourage people in the DEI space, the diversity, equity, inclusion space, to know why they're taking action on things, right? We don't want to just do things for the sake of doing it. We want to know why we're taking action. And so why am I making a land acknowledgement or territory acknowledgement today? Well, for four important reasons, right? Four important reasons. To express gratitude and appreciation to those whose ancestral and territory we reside on. Sorry, to ancestral and territorial uh, territory we reside on. To honor the First Peoples who have lived and thrived on this land since time immortal. To acknowledge the vital and reciprocal relationships between the First Peoples of these territories, land, spaces, places, resources, and all living things. And to recognize, probably the most important, to recognize the historical and ongoing traumas that colonialism has and continues to cause, knowing that more work needs to be done to reconcile those effects. Okay, so it gives you information on territory acknowledgements and why we make them. So again, as I mentioned, my name is Christy Ware. I run my own coaching and consulting business. Um, and some things to highlight about me, um, you can read through the slide here to learn a bit more. Um, but one of the important things is I've been on the uh, Women in Leadership Advisory Board. I've been part of that board for going on 10 months now. It's a volunteer position and we're working on bridging the gap to gender equality. So there's been lots of uh, working with lots of really great colleagues with a variety of different experiences and, and really supporting my learning journey. So that's been exciting and fun. Um, I have been appointed the inclusion chair to this year's BC Winter Games, which is super exciting, which is why I'm here presenting to you today. Um, I'm also uh, the author of two books, Synergize Your Health, The Six Elements for Greater Vitality and Joy. So that's a health book. Um, and the second book is Dismantling the Obstacles to Workplace Inclusion. And so uh, as you may have guessed by those titles, my career has been uh, primarily focused on health and well-being for the first 15 years. And over the last um, three or four years, to taken a, a bit of a pivot and, and blended uh, my two passions for sports and well-being with my passion for creating inclusive spaces uh, in organizations and in communities. So that is what I'm all about. That is why I'm here. And I will share more stories um, about me uh, as we go along to help facilitate learning. So creating a safe space for learning, it's important as we're going through any topics in the diversity, equity, inclusion space um, that we create a safe space for learning. And so I invite you to approach today's education session from a place of curiosity over judgment, right? I encourage you to meet people where they're at. Um, I know this will be a recording, so you'll be watching this um, not as a live session. However, meeting people where they're at in the community, in your own family, in your workplace, right? This goes beyond the BC Winter Games. So meeting people where they're at on their journey means that some people might know a lot about a topic and some people might not know very much. And so I encourage you uh, to not shame or blame anyone for what they don't know, right? We don't need to point fingers and make people feel bad. Um, and we always want people to say what they mean. And so when I encourage you, uh, if you reach out with questions or you have things that you want to follow up with me, say things how you mean them. And if I can support you with any language changes, I'll be sure to do so. I encourage you to show compassion for your fellow volunteers, um, for anyone that you in encounter in the games, right? During the games, as you're, as you're taking on your role as a volunteer, right? Show compassion for all individuals and also have a listening ear because you're likely to learn something. And so that is creating safe spaces for today's session. So our agenda, we're gonna do three important things together. 
The first part of our um, session today will be talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, understanding what it means, what it is. I've also got something I call the three keys to DEI, which I hope will have something that you take home with you and, and use in your community, in your workplace, uh, or just things that you remember as you walk away from today's session to help remind you what DEI stands for and how you can take action on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we're going to talk about the importance of inclusion at the games, and we're going to talk about the culture of the games. So that's part one. In part two, we're going to talk about inclusive versus exclusive language, and what do you do if you make a mistake, right? This is something that people always want to know. Um, part three, we're going to talk about safe spaces at the games and why they're important, and we're also going to talk about um, advocacy for others, so working on allyship and advocacy at the games. Um, and then we'll end with a Q&A, and the Q&A will be you reaching out to me if you have further questions or to anyone at the BC Games um, office to make sure that your questions get answered. All right, so starting off with part one, what is diversity? And so when the sessions are run live, um, this is a very interactive session. People can pop things in the chat and answer the questions as we go along. For the sake of today's recording, um, obviously we can't do it in the same way. I would like you to think about or say aloud what diversity means to you. You can take a moment to ponder that. When you hear the word diversity, what kinds of things come to mind? So now that you have a chance to think about what diversity means, do you think group A, group B, or group C shows diversity? And again, you can answer for yourself. You can be taking notes on a piece of paper. There is a handout that goes with today's session, so you could be taking notes there. So diversity as a definition explores the variety and differences that exist among people. And this includes unique characteristics that define who we are, right? It's accounts for, but it's not limited to all of the things that I've got listed here. So language, education, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, gender identity, social class, right? Physical ability, individuals living with mental illness, neurodiversity, values, beliefs, backgrounds, and on and on and on. Right, so diversity accounts for many things um, about how an individual identifies um, and how they show up in the world. Right, there's lots of ways that we are diverse. So diversity in a nutshell means variety, right? It means differences among people, variety and differences among people. Um, not even identical twins are exactly alike in all ways, right? We are all diverse beings. So this brings me back to this slide when I asked you, is group A, group B, or group C, which one shows diversity? And based on your first answer, your answer might have changed now that you understand the definition of diversity, and I hope that it has. So diversity is in all of the groups. Group A, group B, and group C are all diverse. And the reason for this is diversity isn't something that we can see. It's not visible. It can be, but it's not necessarily visible, right? And so knowing that, um, can be very liberating to go, wow, we're all diverse and unique in our own way, right? I didn't tell you what the dots represented on purpose. I wanted you to think a little differently. And so I hope that I got you thinking. Most people go to the dots obviously represent skin color, right? And because I colored them in a certain way, I've led you down that path, but I didn't tell you what they meant. And so I hope that now you have a different appreciation for what diversity is and what it means, knowing that we are all diverse. So that brings us to our first key. I will respond to diversity instead of trying to change it. So again, if you're taking notes on today's session or things that, you know, what would be important to remember? This is one of the important things, right? Our first key, responding to diversity instead of trying to change it. And responding instead of reacting, right? A lot of times when we don't know something, we encounter somebody that we don't know a lot about, right? A, a social group outside of our own, uh, we can react um, with fear, we can react with resistance, we can react with um, just uncertainty. And so instead of reacting, I encourage you to respond and not, not wanting to change people, but wanting to respond to who they are and what they bring to the world. So how can we do that, right? How can we respond to diversity at the BC Games? There's a few things that we can do. Um, we can use pronouns, right? The correct pronouns for an individual and their name. And we have name badges this year that allow individuals to put their pronouns, a uh, sticker of their pronouns on their uh, ID tag, and uh, being sure that we're, we're, we're you know, referring to people using the pronouns that they've given us uh, and their correct name. Showing respect for all individuals with different needs, perspectives, and abilities, right? This one's really important. Wanting to show respect for all people that we come into contact with, 
even if they're individuals that are outside our own social group or individuals that we're not um, familiar with. Maybe we don't have friends, colleagues, we haven't interacted with individuals who are different from ourselves, knowing that we're all different, right? And so always showing respect um, and, and, and for differences. Addressing groups using inclusive language. We're gonna talk more about inclusive language a little later on, so I won't address that just yet. And showing respect and patience for individuals who English is their second language um, or have to accept, uh, or those who happen to have a speech impediment, um, right, or an accent. So really wanting to show respect for all um, by being patient um, with all individuals and their differing needs. That brings us to equity. What is equity? And again, I encourage you to ponder the idea, is equity and equality the same thing? Are they different? And if they're different, what do they mean? What is equity and what is equality? I like to get you thinking about things before I just give you the answer, right? I like to help you, you know, come to some ideas and thoughts on your own. So the simplest definition to really understand the difference between equity and equality, and they are different, um, this image of the, of the cyclists really drives the point home. So equality would be giving everybody the same bike and saying, here, here's your bike, uh, you know, the events at, uh, you know, the rec center, I'll see you there, and hoping that everyone will be able to get there, right? So equality is giving everyone the same thing. Equity is giving people what they need for success. So the second example, um, individuals have different leg, leg, leg lengths. They have different abilities, right? They're different ages and sizes. And so giving them the bike that they need to get them to the rec center, to get them to the games, um, would obviously the better, be the better choice because they're going to set them up for success. Okay, so that's the main difference between equality and equity. And some people really like definitions, so I always like to give a formal definition. Um, equality means ensuring all individuals are given equal opportunities, liberties, statutes, and laws. Okay, and then again, the difference in equity is about understanding our individual needs and removing the barriers that will enable each and every person to show up and, and achieve to their highest potential. That's the difference. So understanding the golden rule versus the platinum rule is, is, is important. And so this is something that's new to you. I hope that this is something you take away, not only at the games, but also implement into your personal life, uh, your work life, right? This is, a, this is an important piece. So the golden rule is you've probably heard it in your life. You've probably heard your teachers say it or your parents or coaches, do unto others as you'd have done to them, right? Do unto others as you'd have done to them. So you want people to, uh, to do unto you as you wish done to, to, or sorry, to do unto them as you wish done to you, right? That's how we do it. Or that's how the golden rule works. The platinum rule, it takes it one step further and says do unto others in the way they wish done to them, right? So this the main difference being we might treat people in a way that we think they want to be treated, but what if we actually don't know how they want to be treated? Or what if they want to be treated differently than us? Right? We have to recognize that, that we all don't need and want for the same things. So that is where the platinum rule comes in. There are a few challenges to implementing the platinum rule. Okay? There are a few challenges. And I just wanted you know, to bring those to light because it's not something that's simple to do. Um, but I still encourage you to think about it and do it to the best of your ability. So at the games, there are going to be a large number of volunteers, athletes, coaches, and officials. It's impossible to know everyone intimately. And I'm not telling you to walk away from today's education session and get to know every single person intimately. That's not the goal. But I encourage you to make meaningful connections with your team, the people at your venue, people in the games that you participate that you might be seeing regularly, right? Making your best effort to make a connection with people. The second thing, it takes resources to implement the platinum rule. So we've created an inclusive language handout. So I've got a handout that goes with this session. And then I've also got a, um, an inclusive language guide to help support you as you move through the games, wanting to know how do I best, uh, you know, address individuals, what wording is best to use, okay? So what I, what I ask you to do as you are volunteering and participating in the games, um, I would love you to take note of what already exists. So what changes are in place to support this idea of equity and to support the platinum rule? And if there are things that are missing that you notice along the way, be sure to voice those opinions and let us know what's not working because we can't change things for future games if we don't know what's not working, okay? Number three, lack of self-awareness. We must know ourselves 
before we can tell others how we want to be treated. So we want to give people the opportunity to be who they are without judgment. And again, that goes back to creating safe spaces um, for learning. We want to encourage people um, to be who they are. We want to uh, approach individuals from a place of curiosity over judgment, right? And so that can help um, allow people to show up as their authentic. And then number four, it requires humility and openness from both parties. And humility is something we can learn. We're not all born um, being empathetic beings, um, but it's things we can learn along the way if we have the motivation and the desire. Okay, so that brings us to key number two. I will raise others up by giving them what they need for success, not what I think they need. Okay, so that's your key number two. Again, it's on your handout. And uh, if you want to write it down, I encourage you to do so. How do you give people what they need for success, right? How do we put this into practice? Well, one thing we can do is we can ask people, is there anything I can support you with, right? Is there anything I can help you with? That immediately opens the door to an individual sharing what might be working, what they might need, what they might desire, and then you can best support them. Um, staying people-centered, right? Focusing on the person first before their disability, gender identity, skin color, et cetera right? Focusing on the person first. Keep the line of communication open. Approach your role from a place of everything is figure outable. So there's a author and um, a leadership, a business leadership a coach named Marie Forleo, who's written this book called Everything is Figure Outable. Uh, being an entrepreneur for the last six years, I have read many self-help books around understanding how do I move through the challenges that I'm facing in my work or in my life and this book really changed my life. It was super impactful. Everything is figure outable. She's got some really funny stories, um, some really down to earth, uh, really down to earth sense of humor and, and really relatable. And so if you're wanting to take this one step further and go, yes, I, I, I want to live in that mindset where everything is figure outable or I can figure out anything, then you can, you can head over and check out that book. Everything is figure outable by Marie Forleo. Um, the next thing we can do is navigate individual differences from a place of curiosity over judgment. I already mentioned that. And taking a moment to stop, pause, and notice the unique needs of individuals, right? Instead of by responding, instead of reacting, as we talked about in the diversity section, right? It goes a long way for us to stop, to pause, and to reflect on what's going on around us before we respond um, or, or react. I like the word respond, but before we react um, to situations, right? If we want to respond in the best possible way, we take a moment, we pause, and we reflect before we say something or we take an action. Okay, next section, what is inclusion? So again, you can ponder what the idea of inclusion means to you. I asked you at the very beginning today, how does it feel or if you've ever experienced exclusion, what does that feel like, right? What about inclusion? If you've experienced a sense of inclusion, what does that feel like to you? Okay, I get lots of different responses when I ask these questions. So inclusion, again, if we're looking at a, a definition, inclusion means ensuring people feel safe, supported, and that they belong, right? Creating inclusive spaces helps individuals show up and achieve to their full potential, which is obviously the goal for the BC Games, right? Bringing athletes from all over the province together for a common purpose. We want people to come and feel supported, feel welcome, feel like they belong. So with inclusion, inclusion is something we actually have to physically do. Inclusion is an action. Uh, we can't just say that we're inclusive, but then never take action to do that. So we actually have to physically do something if we want to create a sense of inclusion for all. So a couple things I encourage you to think about when I'm talking about here. The first thing is being inclusive to athletes, right? All of the athletes that come uh, here to Vernon for the games. We want to be inclusive to volunteers that we might be working with. They may have differing identities and needs. Be sure that we're being inclusive to all, right? Not disrespecting or not excluding anyone along the way. Being inclusive to the coaches that you may come into contact with, right? Coaches, parents, um, individuals that you might come into contact with, support them, validate them, respect them. And finally, all of the minority groups, uh, equity deserving groups that you may encounter along the way uh, as you're volunteering um, for the games, right? This can include individuals with disability, and neurodivergence could include individuals with um, who identify uh, with a sexual orientation or gender identity different than your own, right? Uh, different of skin color, uh, different ethnicity, all kinds of different ways that people can show up um, in different ways, uh, different identities. And so I encourage you to uh, to be inclusive of all individuals. 
So there's an importance of creating inclusion in sports. A few things I want to talk about here. Um, I've got five actually for you in total. So the first one, we talk about uh, creating inclusive sports or inclusion in sport. Um, it promotes tolerance and reduces bullying, right? As you can see from the slide here, exclusion fuels the fear of difference and inclusion fuels acceptance. So again, I would like to come back to, I encourage individuals, whether I'm presenting to um, you know, an organization, presenting as a part of a volunteer role, whatever it is, whatever group I'm talking to, I always encourage people to, um, to, to celebrate the differences in others while finding common ground. Okay, so this is the whole idea of promoting tolerance, reducing bullying. When we're, when we're celebrating the differences in others, because as you now know, we're all different in our own way, right? We're all diverse and we can find common ground among that. We start to create that community and connection, which is really what I believe sport is all about. Um, it also cultivates empathy, right? Bringing diverse groups of individuals together for a common purpose. We start to create friendships and social inclusion, which is again, a big part of sport. Right? It, it makes you feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself, which I think is really important. Number three, it helps people develop a positive self image. So I stepped on the baseball field at the age of four. It was the very first time I ever um, was introduced to sport. And I never left. I am still into sports to this day in some capacity. Uh, I've coached, um, I've, I've worked as a volunteer coach, I've worked as a head coach. Um, I have still continued to play sports for myself in athletics. And I really attribute my lifelong journey in sport um, to my self-worth, to my to building confidence, right? To building my self-esteem. And it's really important, um, as you, you know, it says here on the slide, uh, to allow individuals to realize their potential for growth. And I believe that inclusive sports, uh, inclusion in sport does just that, right? It helps to lift us up um, and, and build our, our confidence, um, which transfers over to all areas of life right? Not just sport. So really important to recognize that. A couple other things that inclusion in sport does, um, it drives meaningful change. Um, as somebody who identifies as non-binary, I've been following a couple of my colleagues who are very, very um, dedicated to creating inclusive places for trans and non-binary individuals in sport. And so one of the things that's happening right now in the U.S., um, a friend of mine, Jake, uh, is, is their name, and they are pushing for uh, marathon categories for non-binary runners. And so there would be the female category and the male category and adding a third category for individuals who identify as trans or non-binary so that they feel included in sport, right? There's a lot of controversy um, around trans individuals in sport, a lot of challenges that are faced. And so again, um, inclusion in sport drives meaningful change. When change is necessary and we start to pivot and make those changes, again, it creates that sense of inclusion where people can continue um, to, to thrive, to find ways to improve their health and well-being uh, through the connection of sport. Number five, helps us see the person first. That's one of the most important things I believe um, including all people in all aspects of society, right? We're more likely to see the person rather than to focus on their disability, skin color, gender identity, nationality, or other dimension of who they are, right? Of their identity. So important, uh, that's an important piece of inclusion in sport. And that brings us to our third key. I will respect individuals and demonstrate allyship to create inclusion for all. Um, the word allyship, I, I, as I did my live presentation just last week for the games, um, we were talking about this idea of allyship and some people have an idea of what allyship is. Some people aren't certain at all, right? They don't know a lot. Again, looking at where you're at on your journey and in your journey to learning. Um, so I'm just going to give you a, little, a really sort of crash definition. We talk a little bit further about allyship um, in the presentation, but allyship is essentially when an individual in a position of privilege or power um, uplifts, supports, empowers, or seeks to understand equity or social deserving, equity deserving groups or social groups outside their own who've experienced oppression and discrimination. Okay, so that is really the role of allyship. And um, it, it just really gaining an understanding. The four words to take away from that are they uplift, empower, support, and seek to understand. Okay, so those are the four keys to, um, to taking action on allyship. These are the four things that you can think about as we talk more about allyship. And again, I'll refer to it later on in today's presentation. 
So how can you show respect and demonstrate allyship for all? Well, we can smile and display kindness. A smile goes a long way, right? If you are happy and positive and upbeat, and you look at somebody that you don't know and you smile, it's a pretty universal sign um, that you're a welcoming, inclusive person, right? A smile goes a long way. Speak up to things like bullying, discrimination, and harassment when you see it, right? Don't wait until days later or hours later. If you can deal with it in the moment, then that's really supportive and showing respect for all. And I'm not saying to shame or blame people or point fingers or make people feel bad. Um, it's really important when we're speaking up to things like bullying, uh, discrimination, or harassment that we we speak up from a way that um, we 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 own it, right? We want to use I statements. So um, you know what what was being said. I feel really uncomfortable when I hear you say those kinds of things, right? If this is an example, um, we're trying to create inclusion here at the games, and I felt really uncomfortable when you said X, Y, Z, right? And so we're not shaming or blaming, but we're letting someone know that we felt uncomfortable by what was said and that they'll think differently moving forward. That's the goal. The next point there, um, avoid making assumptions about people and instead seek out the facts, right? Physical ability, gender identity, pronouns, those kinds of things. Don't make assumptions about people, find the facts, okay? Because assumptions make a freak of you and me. We don't wanna do that. Invite equity deserving individuals to your table and include them in your conversation. So when I say that, I'm meaning make sure that we invite people to our table and ensure that we uh, include them in our conversation, right? That helps to um, create inclusion for all. So why is inclusion education at the, you know, an important part uh, as well? It relates to the culture of the games. The goal of the BC Games and the BC Winter Games here in Vernon and the BC Games in general is to create a positive environment, right? Where individuals from all over the province can show up in a community for a common purpose and can thrive in their uh, chosen sport, right? So we want a positive environment where people can come because when we create that, again, we create that sense of community camaraderie and everyone feels happy and enjoy enjoying the experience um, of sport, but also making those connections with other people, right? Those friendships and those social, um, social inclusion pieces. The second thing is to show respect, right? Important to respect individuals. Do you need to leave today's session knowing all the terminology and understanding all the language? No, you don't. But show respect for and, and kindness for everyone that you come into contact with. That is the number one, right? Is just to be respectful. And finally, we want to be inclusive, which is the whole point of today's education is to give you tools and strategies to create inclusion um, at the games and beyond. Questions or comments? So if anything has come up from any of the part one, you can always email me personally. If you have questions, christy at christyware.com. So my email is k-r-i-s-t-y at k-r-i-s-t-y-w-a-r-e.com. Or you can um, send over a message to the BC Games office. There's a couple of folks there that will be taking any questions that you have. And if they can't answer them, they'll get me to support. Okay, so make sure that if you have questions, you reach out. Okay, moving on to part two, inclusive versus exclusive language. So again, when we're talking about inclusive versus exclusive language. Um, I asked you the question, what's the difference between inclusive language and political correctness? So think about that for a moment. What's the difference between inclusive language and political correctness? You probably heard people in your life say, well, if I'm being politically correct, those are the kinds of things you might have heard. So what's the difference? Well, political correctness is about looking good to others and being inclusive is about being good. So this is Sam Killerman. Um, I feel like this really sums it up. It's a great little quote. Political correctness is externally driven. We're doing things to look good for others, right? It's not something that we necessarily either believe in. It's not part of our belief system. It's not part of our values or our ethics, but we're doing it because it looks good to others. So an example of this might be adding pronouns to your name badge for the BC Games. Um, you don't really understand why you're doing it, but other people are doing it, so you do it anyway, right? Um, this is externally driven. You want to look good to others like you're doing something inclusive. Well, if we don't know why we're doing something, then we shouldn't take action on it, right? We really want to understand our why and make sure that our why aligns um, with being inclusive, right? With doing something that's internally driven 
And that's related to our own personal values, our own belief system, um, and what drives us to be inclusive and to be kind and respectful to other human beings, right? That's really the difference there. So as we are talking about um, political correctness versus inclusive uh, action, we're going to talk here a little bit about um, some language that has changed over time. Some of you might be really familiar with the language changes and some of you might still be on a learning journey and that's okay. I'm gonna focus on the language to use, I'm not gonna go over the language to avoid. You can take a look at that on the slide here, but the language to use when we are referring to individuals who are indigenous, right? We're either using the word indigenous or that's an umbrella term, an indigenous. And then the three uh, sort of subcategories, if you will, or branches off of that are either First Nations, Métis or Inuit. And so if we don't know um, an individual, the, the community that they belong to, um, the, uh, you know, the community group that they belong to, then we wouldn't know how to refer to them directly. So we could use the term indigenous. Okay. And again, that's showing respect um, and, and respect for individuals' identity. The next area of language, when we're referring to somebody who is black, we can say they are black, we can say they're black, a black athlete, they're a black volunteer, they're African American. These would be the correct um, words to use, the correct language to use, and that is being respectful, right? And again, we can look at the words to avoid. Um, and we're going to talk about making mistakes later on, so don't forget that, right? If something happens, you say the wrong thing, we'll know how to self-correct and talk about that. The next one, when we're referring to individuals who are part of the 2S LGBTQI plus communities, you can use words like lesbian, gay, bisexual, non-binary, transgender, trans man, trans woman, <coughs> excuse me, queer or two-spirit. <coughs> so those would be the correct terms to use. You may hear other terms used by athletes, volunteers, coaches, and that's okay too, as long as you're respecting what they're asking. Um, I would always encourage you to take an individual's lead on this um, and avoid using terms um, on the left here, the language to avoid as, as much as possible, right? Use language that I'm teaching you and language that others have asked you to use. The next one, language to use um, when we're referring to people with disabilities, right? We can use a person living with an intellectual disability, cognitive delay or developmental disability, person with a disability, persons with disabilities, right? There's lots of different ways that we can use it. But if you notice, the common, um, the common thread here is we're speaking about the person first, okay? We're talking about people first. And so just remembering that when you're referring to individuals, um, who may have a mental or physical disability, we're always talking about people first, okay? And there's something to note as we're talking about supporting um, individuals with disability, right, that we are likely to come into contact with through the games uh, in our communities, right, maybe in our workplaces. There's three tips that I have for you or three things I want you to think about when you're um, encountering or supporting individuals who might be in a wheelchair or have some other kind of um, supportive gear, could be a, a walker, could be a cane, could be some kind of braces, anything like that. When we are dealing with individuals with, um, uh, with physical disability, we want to think about three things. The first thing is, I don't want you to assume that they need help, right? Um, always ask, how can I support? How can I be of support right now? Not assuming that somebody needs our help, okay? Because that's, that's a big one. People don't always need your help. Most times they're figuring things out on their own and they actually prefer it that way. They don't want to be looked at as a victim. So just making sure that we are asking, how can I best be of support today, right? And then they can tell you, we give them the open, um, that line of communication to let you know what they might need, want, desire, how you can best support them, okay? So that's number one. The second tip is never push an individual in a wheelchair unless they've asked you to. So my brother was born with spinal bifida and he's paralyzed from under the arms down. So he's been in a wheelchair his entire life. And um, as a child, one of the things, and, and now even as an adult, one of the things that he very much despises, it causes him a great deal of anxiety and overwhelm, is when somebody tries to push him. Um, he's fully capable of wheeling his own chair. And unless someone asks somebody to push him, he doesn't like people being behind him because he can't see them, doesn't know what they're doing. And he's fearful that they might push him over the edge of a curb or bump him into something, right? He'd rather be in control of his own chair. So again, recognizing, even though we might think it might be helpful, 
unless someone's asked you to help them, most times we should just leave it be and they will let you know if they need support. Okay, so it kind of goes back to that point one. The third thing is avoiding assumptions that these individuals are helpless or incapable. Okay, um, nobody wants to be looked at as a victim to their situation. And people are people and have varying different identities, abilities, needs, and we just want to make sure that we don't make assumptions about people. We've talked about this at length, so I'm just giving you that third point as a piece of encouragement. Okay, don't make assumptions about individuals. And then I've got three more things I want you to consider when you're connecting or uh, interacting with individuals who may have um, may have a mental mental illness or a cognitive delay, those kinds of things, maybe speech impediments. There's a few things that we might want to. Uh, we, we have three things that we want to consider when we're supporting those individuals. So the first thing is um, ensure that you know where the safe spaces are in your venue. If you happen to be working at, um, at, at an actual venue and that's part of your role as a volunteer, make sure you know where the safe and quiet spaces are because people can feel overwhelmed, right? There can be anxiety. They may be, uh, you know, the noise might affect them and they might just need to go to a safe, quiet space to reconnect with themselves, to sit quietly, um, to regain their energy and then return to the event, right? So knowing where those safe spaces are can be really, really helpful um, in supporting individuals. This goes for individuals with neurodivergence as well. Um, I know my, my, my family, a couple of family members of mine who actually just need quiet spaces when they're having, um, when they're being overstimulated, right? They just need to calm down. So that's another thing that you can do. Um, second thing, we can be patient with individuals who may have a speech impediment, um, may, uh, may need extra time and patience to explain something to you. Again, be patient, don't rush them, um, be supportive, be respectful, right? So that's a, another way we can, we can support individuals in the best way possible. And finally, if an individual has a care aid or support worker, I encourage you to speak to the individual in question, not to the care aid or to the support worker. Um, it can be easy to do this, and um, I've caught myself doing it as well. Um, but what happens is the individual in question now feels like they're talking about them, but you're not actually uh, speaking to them, right? And that can be really uncomfortable. So regardless of the situation, always, if there's a care aid or a support worker, always defer the conversation to the individual, and then you can be communicating through uh, the support worker if it's, again, around language or, um, or those kinds of things, okay? So just really paying attention to how we support and communicate with individuals with disabilities. And then looking at how do we address individuals of color? Well, people of color, person of color, or equity deserving group. And each of these uh, subgroups, so individual disability, um, individuals identify as 2SLGBTQI+, um, Indigenous, are all equity-deserving groups. Um, so when we're looking at how do we refer to individuals, we, again, putting people first and, um, and being as respectful and supportive with your language as you can. Okay, and there is a guide for this, so you don't have to remember all these terms. There is a guide that I created to support you with this. It is the inclusion, um, inclusion guide for the game. And so talking about exclusive versus inclusive language. So it's nice to know all the terms and knowing how we refer to individuals, uh, individual identities. Another important piece is exclusive versus inclusive language. So when you are addressing groups of people, so <clears throat> as you will notice when I started today's presentation, I didn't say something to the effect of, you know, welcome ladies and gentlemen. I didn't do that, right? My uh, approach was to, you know, hello folks, how's everyone doing today? Um, you know, welcome esteemed guests. It could be various different things. But if you are addressing a group of people or, you know, where, where, where there's, a, there's a group of, of, of volunteers or athletes, doesn't matter who it is, and you're coming to address that group or trying to get their attention, again, removing the binary of male and female or ladies and gentlemen, and instead being inclusive of all, um, referring to people as folks or say, welcome to today's event. How is everyone today, right? There's all kinds of ways that we can be inclusive. Welcome athletes, welcome coaches, right? Welcome volunteers, whatever it is, instead of uh, making it this very rigid male-female binary. Okay, so that's how we can be inclusive of language. So create an awareness by avoiding assumptions. We talked a little bit about assumptions already. Um, it's important that we not assume a person with a disability wants or needs your help. We just talked about this a couple slides back right? They're not victims, they're people. 
just because someone's gender expression, the so gender expression is our external or public facing um, experience of gender, looks masculine or feminine, it does not mean that they identify that way, right? Always avoid making assumptions about people based on how they look. So really important, again, look for the pronoun tag, look for their name, making sure that we're not making assumptions about people. And this is a good, uh, a good little time for a story. Um, I was born she, her, so born female, um, misgendered most of my life, starting from around the age of about six or seven was the first time I experienced being misgendered and have been misgendered on and off my entire life. So it wasn't until about a year ago that I recognized that instead of getting you know, upset, feeling shame, feeling um, bad about who I was, wanting to hide or cover myself um, for who I was, I started to embrace both the masculine and feminine aspects of me. And that is why my pronouns changed from she, her, to they, them. Because I finally realized that I embody both male and female, masculine and feminine. And I want to be proud of that. Um, I want to be proud of that. And so that is really what I came to. And so that is why my pronouns are they, them. And again, my gender expression, the way that I express myself in the world was always getting um, mistaken. And I didn't want that to happen anymore. So whether someone calls me ma'am or sir, um, I no longer get worked up about it. I'm just like, okay, I'm going to identify as that. And, and that's how I feel uh, today. Or, or thank you for acknowledging that I'm both, right? It's important not to make assumptions about people based on their skin color. And so again, this is a, a good point to, you know, talk about, you know, when we interact with individuals in that are so, in social groups outside of our own. So in this case, let's use this uh, person of color, right? Um, it can be easy to have an interaction with an individual and paint, you know, the entire community, especially if we have a negative interaction, just let's say we have a negative interaction with an individual. It's easy to paint the whole community with that same brush to think, oh, all individuals of color are this way, right? And that is not the case. As we talked about with diversity, we're all unique individual beings and we can't be painted with the same brush. Okay, so important to remember that. Stereotypes are hurtful. So it's best to seek out facts about a person or group of people and not stereotype others. Okay. What are pronouns? So lots of questions came up around pronouns for all of the organizations that I speak with um, and lots of individuals really trying to grasp what are pronouns and, and how do we use them and why do we use them? We're going to talk about that now. Um, pronouns are words you may use or like others to use in place of your proper name, right? It's how we refer to people in the third person. So what's important to note is that a person's gender identity, so their internal experience of gender and their gender expression, their public facing or external experience of gender can differ from the pronouns that they use. And this can be very, very confusing um, for individuals who've never considered what it feels like on the inside, right? It feels like to be a male, female, or gender diverse. If you never considered that, some of these concepts can be a little bit confusing. The point I ask you to take away is that use the pronouns that individuals ask you to use. That is all that you need to remember for today. If you want to take pronoun understanding and learning further, um, there's definitely new, more resources that you can find on that. But what the biggest thing for the BC Games is to encourage you to be respectful and kind and use the pronouns that someone has told you to use, okay? Pronouns that you're likely to see, and there are more, but I'm going to share the common ones with you so that you have a base of understanding. And if you see other people's, uh, you know, different pronouns in use, that's okay too, okay? So she, her, hers for a person who identifies as female, he, him, his for a person who identifies as male, and they, them, theirs for a person who identifies as either both male or female, or as neither, meaning that they identify outside the binary of male and female, and they do not identify with just one or the other, or they identify with male. Okay? And so that is how uh, pronouns work. Why do we use pronouns? Why is it important? Well, the first thing, it makes people feel validated and respected. If you're using my pronouns, and I've asked you to use the pronouns they, them, and you are using them, I feel like you validate me, you respect me, you respect my identity in the world. Pronouns can help affirm gender identity for individuals. It gives everyone the opportunity to be who they are, right? To self-identify, which is probably the most important thing. It fosters a welcoming and inclusive environment, which again is what we're trying to do here at the games. 
So a couple things, impact of not using the correct pronouns for someone. Well, there's a few things that can happen. You can, uh, they can feel like they've been invalidated. It can be very hurtful, can be angering, right? Um, someone might feel really uncomfortable and it can lead to something called body dysphoria. And that's that last sort of long image there. Um, body dysphoria is a, a mental condition where an individual becomes very fixated on aspects or one aspect of their appearance and they feel like something about them is flawed because they get misgendered regularly right people mistaken them for the wrong um, identity right wrong gender identity and so they feel very very you know, frustrated in their body and feel like there's something wrong with them and so again using someone's pronouns is very important and validating um, to help support their identity so this is a big piece because mistakes are going to happen i get asked this question all the time what if i make a mistake what if i misgender someone? What if I use the wrong language? What if I say a word that I shouldn't have said? What do I do? And so um, the first thing we can do is we can thank the person for letting you know. So if you say, uh, you know, use a term that's exclusive or we use a term that's you know, inappropriate or derogatory, or we misgender someone, the first thing I'd like you to do is to thank that person for letting you know. So you're going to get self-corrected. Someone's going to say, hey, we don't use that term anymore. Um, hey, my pronouns are, you know, she, her, not he, him, whatever it is, you're going to say, thanks so much for letting me know. Because that, again, lets down the guard to someone being a, a, a defensive. So it drops down the guard, it says, hey, they understood. Immediately, they recognize, thank you for letting me know. We take responsibility for what we said by apologizing once, right? We apologize once. Profusely apologizing is the most uncomfortable thing that can happen. I've had it happen many times in my life, um, typically at the grocery store or when I'm out in the world shopping or at the bank, right? Someone will mostly happen in, like I say, at the grocery store, where especially during COVID, I had a mask on and sometimes wearing a hat, someone would mistake me for a uh, sir. They bump into my card or ask me to move. And then as soon as I turned and said something, they would say, oh, ma'am, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. And then they just profusely apologize. And then I just wanted to get really small and fall underneath my grocery cart and didn't want to be noticed. But everyone around is looking at me by that point. The best thing you can do, thank the person for letting you know that you made the mistake. Apologize once, you know, sorry for that. And I'll do better moving forward, right? That's all that we can do. And learn from it. Learn from the mistake. And that's how we grow and get better. As well. So again, if you have questions or comments, please reach out to me or the BC Games office and we will do our best to support you. So what are safe spaces moving into section three? Safe spaces. Um, I encourage you again to think what the word or what the term safe space refers to. What kinds of things do you think about when you hear safe space? Pondering it for a moment. Again, I like to let you think before I give you the answer. So safe spaces. Safe spaces are three important things. The first one, they're free of bias and judgment. Okay, that's the first thing safe spaces are. They're free of conflict and they're free of criticism or potentially threatening actions, ideas, or conversations. Okay, so that is what safe spaces refer to. So why are safe spaces important at the BC Games? Well, for a few reasons. The first one is safe spaces encourage connection and sportsmanship, right? They encourage people to communicate and connect with one another from varying different backgrounds, ethnicities, gender identity, sexual orientations, right? Abilities. They encourage individuals to connect. When we feel safe, um, we feel like we can connect with others, okay? Second thing, provides an opportunity for people to show up as their authentic selves because it feels like a safe zone, right? A safe place to be. So that's important. Um, the last thing we want is individuals to come to the games feeling like they have to cover themselves or, or pieces of themselves that they have to hide, right? That's the last thing we want because that does not allow people to show up and participate to their fullest potential, right? The third box there with the X, um, safe spaces ensures a zero tolerance against things like bullying, disrespect, discrimination, unkind words, those kinds of things, right? So again, encouraging you to call it in the moment when you see it. Make sure that people are aware they're saying or doing something that is inappropriate um, so that we, again, help to continue to create a safe space for all people to participate. And then finally, 
And the fourth box there at the bottom encourages teamwork, support, and respect for all. Okay, so that is the goal of creating safe spaces at the games. Is there anything else you'd like to add about creating safe spaces? You know, you can take your own notes, record your own ideas. If there's anything that's missing for you, um, one of the other things that came out of my live session was accessibility, right? Making sure that uh, venues, accommodations, um, eating areas, right? Mess halls are accessible for all individuals. So this was another one on the importance of creating safe spaces is ensuring that all individuals have access to all resources and things that they might need. So that was something else that came up. You might have more ideas of your own. Again, questions or comments, you can reach out or connect with the BC Games office and we will support you. And as we're coming to the end here, we've only got a few more slides to go. What is allyship? And we talked um, way back in the presentation at the beginning about allyship. So I told you the definition of allyship. Now I want to know what does allyship mean to you in your own words? When you hear the word allyship, what comes to mind? I'll give you a moment to think about that. People say things like supporter, a friend, right? Those are kinds of words that I often hear. So I'm going to give you a couple of definitions uh, that are important to remember. So an ally. An ally essentially is a supporter, a friend, right? It's an individual who is um, who is supporting equity deserving groups. And I'm not just talking about uh, U2S LGBTQI+, I'm talking about all equity deserving groups, right? We can be, um, ally, we can be take on the role of allyship for all equity deserving groups. And they're pushing for uh, institutional, cultural, and social change, right? They're wanting to see change and, and, and equality in the world, equity and equality in the world for all groups. Okay, so that is an ally. And what's important to recognize about allyship is that, you know, allyship or being an ally isn't a role or identity, or sorry, isn't the isn't it's a, it's a role, but it's not an identity that you get to own. You can't walk around with the identity of I'm an ally, right? It's not like saying I'm a man or I'm a woman or I'm gender diverse. It's really it, it's more of an action. We have to take action to show allyship. We can't just own it as an identity. So just again, watching our language. I might call someone an ally because I feel that they're a supporter to my community but they can't own that without me telling them that they're an ally. We can't walk around owning that. Okay, so again, just watching how we use the language. So that is an ally. An advocate is all of the things that an ally is, right? Again, the, the supporter, cultural, institutional, social change, and supporting equity deserving groups, right? Friend, uh, that hits on that role as well. But the, the difference between an ally and an advocate is an advocate, is someone who's willing to stand up for you even when you're not there. So standing up for me when I am not in the room is what an, as the role of an advocate, right? Taking action to support me, not when I'm standing there listening, but when I'm not in the room, so knowing that the actions that people are, are taking are, 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 in, are genuine and conscious, okay? So even when I'm not around, that's an advocate. A scholar. I would call you a scholar if you are here listening to this presentation today. So a scholar is somebody who is on a lifelong educational journey wanting and seeking to understand equity deserving groups or social groups outside their own and, and trying to best support them, right? That is a scholar, so someone who is interested in lifelong learning. So I would call you a scholar. So an upstander, I'm sure many of you have heard of a bystander. So a bystander, what do they do? You've probably been a bystander at some point in your life. We stand and watch, right? We don't do anything, we watch. So the opposite is an upstander. An upstander is somebody who takes action in the moment when something is happening to support equity deserving groups. So it could be speaking up to bullying. It could be um, speaking up to negative language or exclusive language, right? An upstander deals with it in the moment. They don't wait till a day later. They don't wait till three hours later. They deal with it in the moment to ensure that there is um, course of course of action that are corrected and we support everyone moving forward. When we have individuals taking action towards allyship, we create connection and community. And this is super important because this is really what the BC Games are all about, right? Creating that sense of connection and community for all. Again, comments or questions, you can reach out if you have any. And in closing, 
Something important uh, that I need to ask and to ensure that you understand is do you feel for any reason that you cannot uphold these values at this year's BC Games? So if there's any hesitation that you cannot support inclusive language use, that you cannot you know, support the use of, a, of safe spaces um, and you know, creating that in a positive, in a respectful and inclusive environment at the games, um, then I encourage you to reach out to the BC Games and let them know that. And I hope that if you're here and you've learned something today, that you can uphold these values and make the games super amazing and wonderful in the way that we hope that they'll be. So in closing, what did we talk about on today's uh, today's education session? We talked about diversity, equity, inclusion, right? To know what the terms are uh, and a basic understanding of what they mean. You do not need to know the definition. You just need to have an understanding of what they are. So if someone asked you, you could at least give a bit of an explanation. Um, we talked about safe spaces and the importance of safe spaces at the games. We also talked about allyship and how allyship comes into play and what actions you can take toward allyship at the games. And finally, we talked about the use of an, an importance of inclusive language, right? Understanding the language we want to be using as opposed to the language we want to, um, to unlearn, right? We learn something new and we unlearn something that no longer serves us. So if you're looking to um, catapult your learning even further and you're interested in this idea of creating inclusive spaces um, outside of the BC games, uh, you can check out my book, Dismantling the Obstacles to Workplace Inclusion. You can find it on Amazon, or you can find it on my website. If you type in christyware.com, um, I have a little press icon at the top. You can head over there and check out um, my book. It's a self-help book, so it, each chapter um, explains a, a certain topic around inclusion and then gives you some little exercises to help and strategies and exercises to help support creating inclusive spaces. So I'd like to thank you all for being here and for making the games an inclusive place for all. Thank you for taking the time to engage in this education session. I'm really happy to be here and support all of you on your journey to learning. So again, reach out to me if you have any questions or concerns. My email is christy at christyware.com or you can reach out to Nick Dunlop at bcwintergames.ca. Um, they are also supporting me. Uh, Nick is also supporting me with this, uh, this endeavor of bringing inclusive education to the games. If you want to stay connected, you can follow me on LinkedIn at Christy Ware Coaching and Consulting. And I've got lots of different products and programs that I offer to organizations if you're looking for further support. I also do keynotes um, and individual workshops. So whatever you might need, please reach out and I'll do my best to support you. And I thank you for being here and including all of our sponsors here. You see me all involved in the sports. I thank you so much for being here and uh, being part of this education. And I hope we have an amazing BC Winter Games. Thanks, everyone.